Okay, uh, evening all. Let's continue looking at the uh, Alakine versus Max Over uh, Championship rematch, uh, 1937. Uh, so we'd looked in previous broadcasts at 1935. Let's look at the rematch in 1937. So in this rematch, Alexander was taking it more seriously. I think he'd turned his alcohol in for milk and stuff like that. So he, he, yeah, he was a bit drunk in the previous match apparently, and the, there's evidence that he was drunk in the in the in the uh, the first match. So 1937, uh, could he get back his crown uh, against Max Over? Max Over. So let's have a look. Um, Max was playing white in in the first. We're going to look at the decisive games. Um, uh, sounds should you should have sound now if you press play on play chess. Um, okay, so all right, so d4 from from Max, and um, we have some notes by Max over here as well. Uh, I hope they're not. Uh, I hope they're okay to use a bit. Um, it's quite a while back. Uh, so d5. Okay, so c4, c6, love, defense, very popular even back then in 1937. So it's not a new innovation to play the Slav, how the modern GMs are, are adopting it. It goes back all the way, you know, 1937 World Championship matches. So knight f3, knight f6. We see after knight c3, black actually uh, taking on c4 here. So what does taking on c4 uh, usually do? I've played against this against an IM actually at the London Classic. It wasn't very nice, Simon Ansel. And he got basically very nice pieces because this bishop can come out to f5 and help control the e4 square. If you try and stop black from regaining the pawn with a4, you're weakening the b4 square. So that's another square which is important for black. So these two squares are good for bishops usually. Bishop coming here later, bishop coming here later. And it can be quite an unpleasant position. Uh, let's see, so a4 does weaken that b4 square. Uh, and uh, we see bishop f5 as well. So as I say, black gets very good pieces sometimes and is controlling that e4 square, of course, here as well. So white cannot play with e4, but uh, okay, let's see, knight e5, trying to get the pawn back. Knight bd7, knight takes c4. Okay, queen c7. And queen c7 does seem to be a little bit on the provocative side. Because you would think that uh, oh, if only there was a bishop here, you could gain a tempo. And why not then aim for that with benefits? This move g3, not only to Fianchetto, the bishop here, but also to be able to play bishop f4 maybe later is interesting. And black wants to try and play in the Slav often this move, which is often called an equalizing uh, move in the center to equalizing break to play e5. This is a chance for black to play e5. But it's going into a pin. We see after e5 here, d takes, knight takes this annoying pin, and we've seen this in in the previous match. So it is is um, both sides. I think playing, but both sides. Uh, Alakine and Max playing this position on both sides. So knight f d7. A theoretical debate is continuing here. Bishop g2. And this move f6. Does this move f6 really stand up to the sort of, sort of solid reputation of the Slav? Potentially weakening a few light squares. It is reinforcing that e5 strong point. Is it justified here? White castles. Black plays rook d8. And we see the move queen c1 getting out of the way. Uh, bishop e6 now. Now knight e4. And in Max's notes, uh, he believed that at this time in 1937, this knight e4 was a new move introduced by an Estonian master J turn so it, it, it throws an entirely new light along this main variation of the Slav uh, so white is postponing the exchange on e5 and succeeding in taking advantage of the great freedom of the pieces he's able to deprive the opponent of one of his bishops so let's see um, so how how is how is the bishop um, deprived here well what to do with this bishop on f8 Anakite plays bishop b4 here and the notes indicate black should try and castle as, as soon as possible 
otherwise the d6 weakness is going to become dangerous so this d6 weakness being eyed okay that b4 is a good parking spot as i mentioned but here it's under under critical circumstances white now has got this move a5 which brings some discomfort to b4 because maybe you know rook a4 is possible to harass the bishop this knight is knight neatly protecting a5 black castles here and now actually uh white plays the move a6 which potentially this structure it, it is being a bit undermined here um and actually in the notes more appropriate in order to keep the initiative it, it's indicated rook a4 would might have been better and then taking on e5 then knight c5 hitting the bishop on e6 so i don't know maybe maybe rook a4 was also critical there but let's go with this b takes a6 which is given a question mark um by by max um because it seriously weakens the pawn position without compensation so okay so that's that's interesting that alexander alakine is is volunteering uh structural damage here that's very interesting from a stylistic point of view how open-minded alexander is because the dynamic players will be on the often rule breaking in inverted commas you know the artificial rules but he's probably thinking up peace play or something else why is he volunteered this structural damage here um and in the notes b6 uh, max was was indicating as more correct in inverted commas and then some exchanges could occur on e5 and then taking on well there's a long variation where it's justified that b6 was possible even if black gives up the c6 pawn uh, but uh, okay we've got structural damage here knight takes e5 knight takes and now knight c5 hits the bishop hits a6 and black's compelled to give up the dark square bishop it's pretty nasty otherwise oh uh, no there's even worse even worse in this position in fact if the bishop moves back then we have queen c4 sorry we have bishop takes e5 let's show this Bishop takes e5, and then queen c4 check picks up this bishop. So we can't move the bishop back here. Uh, so he's a little bit in trouble. Giving up the dark square bishop is not very nice. Uh, it's a necessary concession here. Um, so bishop takes c5 was played. Queen takes c5. So we've got the bishop pair, we've got structural damage, we've got the A file to work with. White, white has done very, very well out of this opening. Picked up a lot of trumps here. Okay, so black in this position plays a really ugly move. Uh, and it, it's just an, a really, truly ugly move. G5, so it weakens the king side, weakens the structure a bit more. Bishop goes to E3, okay, we see bishop D5. to try and get rid of at least the bishop pair okay but this this structural damage these pawns are just falling off rook takes a6 uh, so a7 is in big trouble okay uh, there is a little bit of a tactical trap in this particular position apparently uh, that actually um, if white had routinely decided to be too clever here with rook takes a7 uh, there's a pitfall here. Black could do a queen sack. Bishop takes f1. If if the queen is taken here, rook d1. So that's to be avoided. Uh, white's in trouble. So just calmly, just recapture. Just keeping pressure on a7. Uh, we see rook f7, and the structural damage is evident. This this isolated a pawn on the file is just a sitting target. Queen d6. Okay, it's just given up on that a7 pawn. Uh, so will he be able to hold a draw in this ending? A couple of rooks come off, knight c4. Okay, so bishop c5, rook e6. So how can white consolidate here? Bishop d4. Okay, he's keeping an eye on f6. He's protecting b2. So if rook e2, bishop takes f6. Uh, so rook takes e2 was played 
bishop takes f6 g4 all right maybe, maybe this is like becoming a bit dangerous this check using that pin um, so here king f1 is played after which the notes indicate is practically over um, if black had tried instead of rook takes e2 here sorry instead of rook takes e2 um, well knight d2 is no better uh, in, in this position okay instead of g4 if you tried knight takes b2 here uh, there's rook a2 so we've got that nasty pin uh, which is pretty nasty there uh, so this this is, helps explain g4 so this g4 move here well it's setting up that cheapo but king f1 sidesteps any cheapos with knight, knight e3 uh, so we see rook c2 check uh, mopping up some pawns now rook takes g4 knight takes b2 just going into the rook and pawn ending is, is good enough bishop takes b2 so the rook and pawn ending is perceived as an easy technical win here by max so he's very good at this kind of precise chess if he's got an advantage he can he can win from here this this rook and pawn ending he's got three to one here uh, so how does he how does he do it brings the king in starts attacking h7 keeps the black rook passive starts bringing his pawns up the board why not it's overwhelming it's hopeless really so an unfortunate start for the match for Alexander Anakheim uh, if we go back there was a key opening uh, novelty then knight e4 which seems to give black a lot of problems so the question is should black ever repeat this line if we go back uh, so this this novelty at the time in this line uh, is to do with uh, delaying capture on e5 this knight e4 here uh, any of you are aware that this was a theoretical novelty out of interest at the time to play knight e4 uh, I, get, I guess you're not is you'd have to <laughs> you'd have to know quite a lot about chess to know that this was a novelty at the time but knight e4 does seem to put black in a little bit of trouble uh, I think the key thing one of the key things about it is being able to take and then play knight c5 because it's it's hitting all sorts of things so it was a bit of a downhill um, after after getting this big advantage it was kind of downhill for black so obviously max over is a very very strong grandmaster uh, for alakine to try and uh, take on in this rematch and he's under no illusions and this this first game is is certainly um not uh, uh an, an indicator that he's going to be an easy opponent to try and get back his world title from uh so king f1 just sidestepping any problems and mopping up these pawns yeah a bit of bit of a technical exercise game unfortunate but sometimes that's how chess is if you get a big trump card from the opening you can just convert it so let's look at the next decisive game in the match okay so and the notes here are by Alexander Alakine uh, I've got notes by Alexander Alakine which are interesting uh, so in this game um, uh, okay d4 again and we see repeat of the Slav so what's going to be different in this theoretical debate okay very different now Alexander varies considerably he plays an immediate e6 here and he indicates this is played twice by Bogolodzibov against him in the 1929 match and the experiment didn't succeed uh, you know uh, he'd only lost one and drawn one a uh, Bogolodzibov but uh, okay so let's see Bishop g5 is played and we see Bishop b4 Knight takes c4 
and um, actually Alakine considers this as very harmless this move knight takes c4 so why would you think such a move is harmless well it does offer uh, uh, a forcing move queen d5 so attacking a knight putting pressure on the king side here bishop takes f6 is played and okay there's two choice is there two choices uh, or not really can black take on f6 with pawn well actually he takes on he takes the knight and he gives the notes actually funny enough better is taking the bishop um, in his notes why why would he consider it better to take the bishop here uh, his notes g takes knight e3 uh, queen goes to a5 queen b3 with better prospects for white for some reason well he didn't like this uh, maybe okay so he played queen takes c4 instead oh pardon me pardon me i'm getting that structurally looks terrible no he'd, he'd rather uh like offer g7 no this he's indicating queen takes c4 is better than g takes f6 not worse pardon me queen d2 uh and now uh, this this is a very interesting move uh, because uh, by reinforcing the knight white is now potentially threatening e4 to win the bishop so he's leaving the bishop to be taken now if he had taken on g7 well no bishop takes c3 is a serious threat in this position because the rook's going to be hanging so he's got to do something about c3 here uh, so queen d2 with the idea that okay g takes we've got e4 to regain our peace so g takes f6 e4 attacking uh, the queen and bishop okay so queen b3 e takes and it's it's a bit um kind of messy this position what what is actually going on here uh, at least white hasn't got the bishop pair um and th there seems to be some pressure on the black position but let's see knight d7 f takes f takes bishop e2 and black castles black seems to have quite an ag aggressive position uh, and if white castles king side you might think the g file but this bishop could get take care of a few things and the king might be a bit weak on the queen side uh, okay let's see white did castle not fearing any g file attack and and Alakine writes that the last few moves were practically forced the position reached is about equal attacking possibilities for both sides in fact now this next move does look logical it, it looks like a logical break in the center e5 uh, so what does it do this e5 move um, okay the, I mean there's an alternative uh, indicated that maybe knight b6 for knight d5 is an alternative okay well, let's go with e5 it's taken knight takes queen c1 keeping hold of c3 and also maybe introducing uh, some other possibilities now uh, soon but what about this g file would would you be worried about this g file And black, in, you know, inflicts some something here. Bishop takes c3, b takes, and goes for that g file. So is this dangerous? You know, he's got things like queen d5 potentially, just threatening to mate. Okay, this next move, queen e3, is played. Now, I, I guess, uh, well, queen d5, g3 is possible here now because the queen's covering that f3 square. Uh, so king b8 oh in Alakine's notes he does mention queen d5 king b8 was played but queen d5 he does actually mention this if queen d5 was played we just simply play g3 here okay and if in this position if queen d2 we can just take and rook fe1 and this this is a nice position and uh, this, this is an interesting position 
okay and if knight d3 there's rook a d1 okay so this this is this is okay so queen d5 is not a big deal in this position king b8 was played okay g3 so in advance of any queen d5 rook d7 okay we see rook a b1 offering the a pawn bit of dynamism queen c2 and now rook f e1 which alexander alkine uh, note says that one of the most subtle moves of the game uh, white is preparing the move f4 with this believe it or not uh, now why why would that be the case let's see in his notes f4 immediately we have rook d2 ignoring the threat on the knight and th this is a problem because if rook f e1 then we have knight d3 here you see this this game data too large oh dear ah oh. whoops pardon me <laughs> sorry I'll, I'll have to start the broadcast again Woo. on play chess oh dear are we back press play sorry about this okay sorry I just had a bit of, I have to remove those notes bit of a shame that um, sorry uh, so press play if you're on play chess uh, so we'll go back so he'd played this move uh, to prepare f4 um, okay so we see queen d2 and the queens come off and now f4 so is this f4 a big deal well actually we're gonna see now the bishop getting quite good against the knight the knight's being driven back bishop c4 attacking the rook and white's got that e file so is this a tangible advantage building up Rook e6, attacking f6, that's protected. Rook b e1, De definitely white seems to be a little, little bit better. Because you can just look at this knight, it's kind of locked out of the position with this structure. This knight's kind of not such uh, an interesting knight here. Uh, so this bishop, okay. On the other hand, you might think, well, white's got these weakened pawns, surely. Is this really enough to win from this position? Let's see, king c7. White takes off a pair of rooks and h4, victimizing that knight. And he's got a 3 to 2 pawn majority to work with. Brings his king in. King f3. This c3 pawn's not so bad because you can imagine knight f5, there's no knight d4. c3 pawn is not that bad. Knight d5. Okay, and now it is actually attacked though. White doesn't want to play a poxy defensive move like rook c1. He counterattacks on this pawn with bishop d3. And that's moved. And now we see check. And now, actually, the c3 pawn is simply given up with uh, king g4 to try and get more time to get to black's pawns and get his pawns going. So black is not tempted here to take on c3. Plays knight e7. We see bishop b1. You can see that this bishop is starting to look better than the knight, and the king is starting to look quite aggressive for the h6 pawn. King e8, king h5, king f7, and now the bishop is very useful here, check. And now this pawn drops, bishop moves, it was attacked there. And now g4, and this, this is starting to look hopeless, and so much so, uh, with this potentially huge pawn here coming up, that black actually resigned. Sorry. Um, G G five. Um, I I have the wrong game as well. But black black resigned here. Um, so th this this looks hopeless uh okay 
So is everyone convinced that black is in the helpless position or should we should we play a few more moves here? You can see that this this pawn coming to um to G7 is pretty dangerous. Uh, everyone is convinced, yeah. I'll just I'll just ask. A loss for black. Yeah? Or well, actually I could just ask. Yeah. Okay, um so that that was that was an interesting game. Um, so so um, yeah, this this looks as though what, what's going on here? Uh, Black um, had a bad position again from from this opening, and White picked up an uh, important uh, trump card. Um, but I just, I just actually, I want to make sure who was white and who was black in this game, because uh, because it had a lot of annotations. Uh, let's just make this clear uh, that actually, uh, because of the annotations, this this has been a bit confused. Alexander Alakine was playing white in this game. Max Over playing black, I believe actually. So this was game two. So it was an immediate comeback after losing the first game. Alakine had just struck back. Okay, I'm going to try and strip out these annotations from now on. They don't have too many, so there will hopefully be less technical issues from now on. So it's won all the match, and let's look at this game now in in round five. Okay, so in round five, we see again. Okay, d4, d5, c4, and thankfully something different. D takes c4 from Alexander Alkheim. Queen's gamut accepted. Knight f3. And we see a6, e3, knight f6, bishop takes c4, e6. This looks like all standard stuff in the queen's game, but accepted. So the idea of queen e2 is often to be able to play rook d1. Uh, so knight c6, knight c3, okay. b5, bishop goes back, bishop e7. And white has the option of avoiding an isolated queen's pawn, which he takes up here with d takes c5. Uh, so bishop takes c5 and he liberates this bishop. Okay, so b4. And the knight doesn't move here actually. We see e5. Um, more aggressive. b takes c3, e takes f6. And okay, there's, there's a few problems here. Uh, for example, it looks as though these pieces are a bit shaky. Uh, for example, you know, queen c4 might be dangerous. Or if you know if Queen F6 Bishop G5 might be dangerous, so Black took with the pawn here, and Queen C4 indeed was played. Queen B6, Queen takes C3, eyeing that F6 pawn. And uh, okay, Alexander defends that with Knight D4. Okay, and that's taken off. Bishop takes D4, but we have a position with the Black King in the centre. And you might think that this issue of a king in the center, uh, you know, it doesn't happen so much now in modern grandmaster games. The king is unfortunately dangerously in the center here. Uh, and we see a punishment now with bishop a4 check of that fact. King e7. And now it gets a bit nasty for black. Uh, Max plays, instead of moving his queen, he plays bishop e3 using that pin on the queen. He's got a dangerous initiative here with this king stuck in the center. It's a bit embarrassing this position. Bishop takes c3. What else? I mean, what else is he going to do? Uh, e5 looks just too, too, too weakening. So bishop takes b6. And now we've got, you know, this threat of bishop c5 keeping the king very dangerous and also of course we're threatening to take this bishop bishop e5 rook a d1 renews the threat of bishop c5 without any bishop d6 the king tries to escape and now we see f4 so what is this offering b2 yes and now rook f3 what is going on here well check is now with renewed strength because of rook g3 check the king is going to be hounded here Bishop b7, rook g3, horrible threat, bishop c5 check. Look at this, both bishops. The king is in mortal trouble here. And so much so, this is at move 23, 
it is actually hopeless for black. What can black do in this position to stop bishop c5? There's, there's nothing. Um, do you want to call out a resource and I'll tell you the refutation? Or are you aware of the refutation? For example, if black tried rook c8, what would you play here? This wasn't played, but if black tried rook c8, white to play and win, if I give you 20 seconds starting from now. So time for you to wake up. Okay, <laughs> wake up. <laughs> Everyone, what, what would you play here as, as white? On play chess, anyone? Anyone volunteering? White playing win, forcing moves? What forcing moves are really good here? Come on. Right, yes. If you look at the forcing moves of the position, rook d8 is, is a disaster. It's just taking the, the rook off c5. And this is mating. Look at this mating that we've set up against the black king. Uh, so it's, it's just mating, isn't it? So how on earth did Alcon get this position from the opening? It's we see this, you know, it just shows what we've seen is clear cut evidence that even you know the strongest players in the world give them a bad opening and they will slide down that hill and they will have completely lost positions. He's having to give up the bishop in the game. He plays bishop a3 here, desperate, gives up the entire whole bishop. I really wonder if it's worth carrying on to look at this. He gives up the whole bishop. He's a bishop down now, and he carries on. Maybe he's just annoyed of himself. But um, what a disastrous opening from the Queen's Gambit accepted. Okay, credit to him for varying from, from that Slav defense. At least he gave the audience uh, something to think about, that he can play different openings. But my move 24, he just lost the piece. He plays on a little bit. Rook g8, that's, it's easy to defend. It's just a piece down. Yes. There's not much going on. A piece down. Uh, so I think what we need to look at is the actual opening. Uh, it's, all, it's all pretty uh, easy to win from this position. Uh, a bishop up. So let's, let's check this opening. Um, Yeah, but Alakine was on the receiving end here playing the game. He was on the receiving end. He's got some dodgy opening theory here with this Queen's game accepted. So let's look at this again. Why was this? Uh, but in the first match, uh, we know that um, uh, Max had really thoroughly prepared his opening theory, especially. He felt that was a weak spot of Alexander Alakine. Um So what on earth happened here, which was so disastrous in this opening? We saw this b5, which looks okay. It's the laying king side development for a moment. We see d takes c5, which is an annoying move. It avoids the isolated queen's pawn. Uh, it brings some forcing moves on the board, like e4, e5, where this pawn would normally have been an isolated queen's pawn. It's now an aggressive weapon for e5. So maybe the mistake here is is this move b4. It's a bit overly ambitious. Um, but what does black do? You know, if he plays e5, he's weakening terribly d5. He doesn't want, if he plays b5, you know, if he plays bishop b7, maybe that's, I don't know, what to suggest here. But uh, theoretically, uh, this doesn't look good in, in this sequence b4, e5. Taking, taking. This position already looks dangerous. Black has loose pieces. Uh, the king's still in the center. Um, and yeah, it just doesn't look too good. Uh, if he had moved at the bishop, maybe that's better here. Bishop e7. Uh, it doesn't doesn't look uh, that appetizing. Bishop a4, c6 looks loose. I don't know. It doesn't look that great with the fractures on the on the, on the king side. Um, so yeah, but this is goes to a completely lost position uh, with this this neat idea. Bishop e bishop check 
and then bishop e3. Uh, if the king had gone to f8, then bishop h6 check. One would expect it looks looks terrible. Mating um, potentially. We've, we've just you know the queen sliding across. Uh, so what a terrible opening, really. I mean that's what we can say about this. Uh, this is a terrible position to have. And he just ends up losing a piece by force. Bit of a shock. Um, no need to carry on there. So black's just losing a piece. So let's let's go on to the next decisive game. So in round six, okay. So Alexander playing white, uh, d4, d5, Slav, knight c3, d takes e4. And this is the sort of Slav gambit actually. White plays an immediate e4 here. Okay, so we see e5. Bishop takes c4. Very interesting opening this one. E takes d4. And now the move knight f3. And I don't know if you've seen this before, but um, if d takes c3 here, what would you play as white? If I gave you 20 seconds starting from now. Anyone? What would you play as white? Come on. Anyone forcing moves? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so bishop f7. You try and decoy the, the king away from the queen. So king e7, then what? I think it might be sufficient uh, in in this position. I think you might be able to play bishop g5 check and then take here maybe and then play e5. Or am I mistaken? Is there king e7 there? Well, you could move the bishop back here. Uh, that looks kind of good anyway. Uh, maybe there's much better. There could be a stronger sequence here. Um, bishop g5 looks logical to me. Uh, Okay, so anyway, so black played b5, and ridiculously, we've got another scenario with a king in the center might be an issue at the world championship match level. So, this is 1937, so the evolution of chess style, the opening theory was, was a bit dodgy, to say the least. Um, so, we see knight takes b5 being played in this position, and already, uh, it's I think an idea here. Is that if C takes, I think, what do you see white has in this position? If I give you 20 seconds here. Anyone? Forcing move here, or rather get, get material, clue. What do you play in this position? Okay, all right. I'll just. Show, I think Bishop D5 just just win the rook. Uh, so that wasn't taken. We see Bishop A6. Well, well done if you saw Bishop D5. Bishop A6, and now just Queen B3. I'm at F7. That's protected. And White just castles here. So big problems for Black. Um, if if I think if he takes here, we've we've still got this problem of bishop d5 potentially, because here I think we have queen takes b5 and we're still on b7, so that, that's a big problem. So black played bishop takes b5. We see bishop takes b5, and uh, black's not interested in taking on b5 here. He plays knight f6. Bishop goes back, knight bd7. 
Knight takes d4, miserable position because you know things like knight c6 and knight f5 here. Rook b8 is played. Queen goes, drops back. Queen c5. Knight f5 is played, and that, that eyes g7, so the bishop can't easily move now. And this is a very clever move, actually, knight f5, because it seems to be inviting black to exploit this pin uh, with knight e5. But white has a very powerful move here to counter that pin. Bishop f4, creating a pin of his own on the poor rook on b8. Now we see knight h5. And white wins a little bit of material here with this combination. Bishop takes f7. Uh, this knight dare not take because uh, I think, well, we, we just take the queen and then we take here and that's winning material. So we see king, uh, not not take with the knight, he takes with the king. So queen takes c5 and bishop takes e5. So Alexander is for the moment out of the opening a winning position it's just a winning position he's two pawns up for nothing move 18 it, these these openings are absolutely disastrous aren't they in this match what you know Platt doesn't need to play on from this he's just two two pawns down um but he plays on a few more moves. Rook b5. We see bishop d6. That can't be taken because it will be a check. So um, bishop b6. b4. Rook d8. The rook, this a rook just supports the bishop. c5 that's just taken to get this nasty pin with rook d5 winning material or uh, well I think it is actually winning material potentially uh, if rook c8 doesn't save the situation but it's pretty it's pretty hopeless with this pin here uh, so black resigned here he is already like two pawns down um, okay and actually, either if he does play, uh, if he did play on with rook c8, we can actually just take, and then whatever rook takes, we can we can play knight d6 check, uh, winning the exchange anyway. If he takes like that, <laughs> wins the exchange like that. If he takes like this, we win the exchange the other way, knight d6 check. Okay, so uh, pretty nasty stuff, these openings. <laughs> If we look at this opening disaster, another opening disaster. Uh, so at least Alexander was on playing white. Um, the openings are disastrous because they were testing new territory in the Slav. This, yeah, yeah, they were pioneers playing the game. Yeah, pioneers. Yeah. So knight f three. So this b five. It looks like uh, uh, reminiscence of the Morphy versus Allies offer a game in some respect with the king in the center being exploited with a knight takes b5 but here it's it's subtly different it's about the bishop d5 tactic uh but uh yeah this this is a nasty position uh one question here i think we should answer try and answer is well f7 no it has to, it has to be protected forget taking like that so he protected f7 and like the morphe allies came development is hindered and here we see um, yeah it's just a miserable absolutely miserable opening position but in this position oh this is the one if C takes do we have Queen b5 or is Queen d5 it's the strong move here Queen d5 forget Queen b5 we just hit the rook do we let's see if I give you 20 seconds what would you prefer Queen takes b5 or Queen d5 20 seconds to have a look at this one
Do you agree Queen d5 looks stronger? Yeah, it does look strong, doesn't it? I was, initially, I think I was wondering about Queen b5. Queen d5 looks stronger, it looks clear cut. This poor rook. <laughs> okay, so disastrous openings, yeah. Um, so the bishop goes back, and uh, after the knight takes d4, this is horrendous. These these forcing moves, it's just uh, knight f5 is a very clever move, though, because uh, it looks as though this is a bit fragile. But knight f5, very clever, with the idea that this rook is unfortunately a tactical target. Uh, so bishop f4, very nice. So winning winning uh, material. And it's it's all over pretty shortly after that. Okay, let's, so we haven't really seen too many huge battles so far. Uh, let's look at another game. So in round seven, does it get? Do we get to see a juicy game in round seven of the match? Okay, Max is playing white. D four. Should we flip the board for fun to play as Alexander Alakine? D5, different perspective. C4, C6. Knight F3, Knight F6. Knight C3, he takes on C4, A4, Bishop F5. Slightly different uh, variation here because white isn't going in with this knight e5 idea to get the pawn back he's going with e3 to try and collect the pawn back slightly different e6 bishop takes c4 knight bd7 so far no one's lost totally out of the opening that's great news after castles bishop d6 queen e2 preparing it seems e4 that stopped in its tracks with knight e4 blockading that e pawn keeping the bishop hand in for a moment Knight takes e4, bishop takes e4. White wants to liberate the position, so knight d2, kick the bishop away, and then surely, you know, play for f3 and e4 soon. Bishop g6, e4, or even without f3. Intriguing. Provocation, because look at this position, it looks a bit prov provocative. White's advancing in the center. Bishop b3. Black castles. F4 looks very uh, interesting to try and trap the bishop with F5. Now, here here is something uh, quite interesting, indeed. That Alakine, uh, Alexander he reacts to this with knight F6. And for me, when I, when I looked at this earlier, well, it means, for example, f5. Have we not got the move bishop h5? Also, this d pawn can be taken with check. Is another interesting thing here. Okay, white's move in this position, believe it or not, is the move bishop c2. And Alexander takes on d4 with check. The king goes to h1. Okay. And you might think in this position, bishop h5 uh, is, is an answer uh, or a move in this position. Why not play bishop h5 immediately if, if there's a problem uh, here with this? Okay, white has definitely strengthened the e4 pawn. Um, so, this, this is a question to you. A little, a little bit of a mystery. I should have engine checked it. But in the game, we see the move queen b4 being played. Now, was this just a huge blunder here or something? Because now g4 uh, threatens to really squash this bishop. Or was it kind of ingenious? Uh, has he just fallen into a trap? 
if black tries h6 here for example the bishop's really getting done in surely f5 it looks pretty nasty that there's compensation you know even this rook could transfer maybe for an attack it could look pretty nasty uh, so what we see here um, of the g4 is very interesting in itself but instead of the move queen b4 okay one question I do have myself is does anyone see anything particularly wrong with the move bishop h5 if this was played if I give you 20 seconds here what would you play to bishop h5 if you were playing white in this position Does anyone see anything good for white? Knight f3 is the suggestions on both play chess and, and stream. So you just be a pawn down then. You just accept being a pawn down. It's interesting. Okay. So if bishop takes f3, well, black hasn't got a problem piece, but maybe you know there is a dangerous uh, initiative here, or something. Okay, interesting. M maybe bishop h5. If someone engine engine checks this game at some point, um, m maybe this this next move uh, was potentially a blunder. We need to investigate it. Queen b4. Because it seems now g4 extinguishes bishop h5 and provides f5 for squashing bishop. And the reaction to this is interesting. Uh, he doesn't want to squash bishop. He goes for a kind of lesser evil looking position. Alexander just casually plays rook ad8, allowing his bishop to be squashed and won with f5. We see e takes, e takes. Queen is attacked. And he picks up another pawn. He's going to pick up three pawns for that bishop. So three pawns for the bishop. Is it enough? Bishop d1 and voluntarily takes the queens off and plays rook d4. And it's a certain uneasiness about white's position here. The extra piece against the three pawns. Uh, so this isn't so easy. Check. The king goes to h3. It looks a bit awkward. Rook d8. We see bishop g5. The rook goes to attack b2. That's protect. Uh, no, the rook's attacked there. Rook goes to e4. Bishop b3. Rook e2. There's pressure for being a piece down. A lot of pressure. Because now this this pin looks quite nasty on f3. In fact, rook takes h2 is now threatened. It's a mate threat, isn't it? Rook takes h2 is threatening mate because that knight is pinned. So it's not the most comfortable position all of a sudden for white to be in. We see king h4, and it's like white's been dragged into a mating net here. Rook takes f3. Rook takes f3. Rook takes h2 check. If the king dares to, to come over here, it's, I think it's just being mated with rook h5. That's mate. Ouch. So rook h3. And black's winning material, if nothing else. He just plays g5 check. So he's material up again. He got back his piece with interest. <laughs> Funny game. Weird game. He's three pawns up at the moment. Now, after check, White resigned. So, did White really lose control after being a piece up, or was it really quite difficult? Uh, that's one for investigation, uh, technical investigation. Uh, let, let's let's see, but. Um, 
it looks as though that bishop was a was a, a target to be squashed um, and it looks all of white's play was geared up to squashing black on the king side uh, but with this curious episode here that um, with this move d d4 was attacked and it was kind of ignored but what else if knight f3 we drop the e4 pawn how does white actually defend d4 here if queen e3 then you know bishop b6 so i don't know about this f4 move it looks a bit dodgy in some respects um because again if, if we move the knight we're going to lose the e pawn so white's losing that d pawn so the question here is you know did did he become complacent why not bishop h5 uh, we see the move queen b4 instead interesting uh, mystery would anyone here have played queen b4 out of interest just inviting g4 that did weaken white's position a lot to invite the, the, the bishop being uh, trapped uh, curious game um, I guess I guess if we engine check this position maybe Bishop h5 will come up as a move but um, has anyone got an engine to check this position if I give you a few if I give you 20 seconds to have a look if Bishop h5 someone saying Queen e1 and h3 okay Bishop h5 Queen e1 I don't really believe in uh, h3 it's going to be weakening dark squares we play for h3 and g4 again surely possible you know but also we have we do have ideas like this dynamically so this this was a very interesting continuation anyway uh, Gaga twelve oh four Queen B four is the engine move. Are you kidding? Just inviting the bishop to be trapped. Rook F D eight. So it's interesting anyway. Queen Queen B four seemed to work out well. If you look at G four, I mean, okay, it's winning with Tyrrell, but there's this draft around the king here. Uh, so it's not so clear cut. Obviously, if he takes with the g pawn, then we've got bishop h5. So he's going to take with this pawn, which is going to expose these rooks down the centre of the board. He's going to lose three pawns for that piece. Um, and okay, it looks it looks as though there's a big problem here for how to develop the pieces. Uh, so this check you might ask well why didn't the king go back to h1 would the king have been safer there king h1 what would we have played in this position is this about equal pawn pusher indicates equal Someone else indicates it's better for black. This position. I'm not sure what a crushing move here would be for black. Black being a piece down. Uh, okay, but yeah, it's difficult. If it's difficult for white to coordinate the pieces, it's difficult. Ninety-five. Ninety-five is suggested. Okay, it's it's one for investigation. So let's so in the game the king was drawn out unfortunately with king h3. It just got in big trouble pretty soon. Uh this is very difficult to play now. Uh so that had some move um I guess uh, we got a mate threat, and, white, and black is getting back the material by force. Okay, uh, interesting games. Uh, so let's look at another one. So in round eight, so 
So Alexander playing white d4, and we see knight f6. Let's 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 flip the board. So we see actually, thankfully, we see a different opening. Great. We see actually a Nimzo engine after knight c3, bishop b4. We see a Nimzo engine. So Max over playing the Nimzo engine here. Queen c2, Kaspar's favourite move, one of the most popular moves in the position. Queen c2. d5. c takes d5. Queen takes d5. e3. C5, that strikes at the center. A3, white collects that dark square bishop. With, um, so because black plays, plays bishop takes C3, B takes C3. Knight BD7. F3, although white's behind the development, he's got his trump bishop pair to play with. Now this doesn't look entirely, uh, it looks a little bit suspect intuitively to play this next move. C takes d4. Doesn't it open up the position a bit for this bishop potentially? C takes d4. Black doesn't routinely just castle here. He plays knight b6. Uh, and you might think, why didn't he routinely castle? Knight e2. And again, he's delaying castling on the king side. He plays bishop d7. He's trying to extract some sort of advantage here, maybe trying to get a forcing move in or try and use the c file against white's queen. We see knight f4, queen goes back. Now black's in trouble, the king in the center again. We've got a king in the center again as an issue exposed because of bishop d2. Black cannot castle now because a bishop b4 surely would just skewer the queen and rook. Black can't castle, surely, if he did. Bishop b4. This opening theory is on the verge of totally disastrous in this match. Uh, if, this, if this is the position now black has volunteered himself to be in, he's given white the trump card, the dark squad bishop, and opened up th the lines. For this bishop to be naturally effective with bishop b4 here. So rook c8, just queen b2, black still can't castle. Can black take away the b4 square from the bishop? He tries to, knight fd5. Okay, he's got b4 covered for the moment. That's taken. And if we take with the knight, then are we not losing? Um, are we losing the b7 pawn or is it just e4 is the issue? So whatever the case though, e takes d5 was played, condemning the king in the center. How many times? The match has only started. It's only round eight. And the opening theory is so bad that they're, they're both having this problem with the kings in the center. So bishop b4. Okay, so all white needs to do is just get his pieces out and rip open the e file in principle. Uh, this next move is nifty, yes, king f2. Okay, so he just wants to play for e4 and exploit the king in the center. Knight a4, queen d2. What can black do with this bishop cutting? You know, this, this major resource can't get into the game. Uh, he might, you might consider, well, why, why doesn't black play, for example, f6? That might be an idea. But he doesn't, actually. He does a further move, which in principle seems to weaken more things. He plays b6, <laughs> just offering up the a6 square for the bishop with tempo, which is gladly accepted. Bishop a6, rook b8. And now why not just rip open the e-file? The king's in the center. E4. I know, it's disastrous. 
Would these players be over 2400 fide by modern standards? Would you think? From the evidence so far of this match? Or is it just the opening theory making them look really, really bad? It, it just looks abysmal for black to be in this position to have given up the dark square bishop, king in the centre. It, it just looks unbelievable. Um, does Max need to be in his preparation to get a decent position at the opening? Uh, this just looks completely lost already. But, um, all right, uh, there's a materialistic uh, issue here exposed uh, by black. Okay, he might think he's going to munch this bishop here. So he plays b5. Is he going to munch the bishop? He's set the trap around the bishop. Well, this backfires, funny enough. Um, can you see a good move for white in this position if I give you 20 seconds starting from now? Anyone? Good move for white. Probably even better than the si the simple looking move. Ed might be good, but Queen F four was played. Queen F four, hitting that rook. So he followed by E takes D five, opening that E file. So, you know, Black's playing a rook down, basically. He's playing a rook down. This is a problem. Bishop e6. Forget the bishop. Rook ac1. Just make the black king. You know, come down with rook c7 and queen c7. Black finally plays f6 now. Too little, too late. Rook c7. Nasty things are being threatened, like rook e7 here. Or even just rook g7, maybe, and queen f6. King d8 is played. Rook takes a7, protecting the bishop, and, and queen c7 to follow. Black resigns. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's a disaster, isn't it? What we've seen, I'm taking the games in sequence of the decisive games, and we have seen truly disastrous opening theory here so far in this match, up to round eight. And we'll continue looking at it next week, but uh, let's, let's review this game uh, quickly again. So the Nimzo engine, but yeah, they're the early pioneers. It's uh, dangerous that it's not being theoretically analysed, and they're having they're improvising on their own resources. But this looks, in principle, like a bad idea to give White uh, the bishop pair, and then kind of opening up the position for this dark square bishop to be smiling, to be very very happy uh, very soon. So c takes d4 is allowing the bishop to come like this with great effect. And I had a nice game myself in the Hearts League where I was able to cut the opponent's king in the centre and deprive him using his rook. And that's a great pleasure to have in chess. <laughs> to, to, to be playing like a rook up like that. So uh, here the pleasure was uh, Alexander's here. Just pl playing basically a rook up. It's, it's already a bit too late, unless he wants to lose the exchange for bishop b4. So we see knight takes d5, maybe a lesser evil move would have been just knight takes d5, just get out of this, try and get out of this card. I think oh, we have e4 here, I guess. Just kick the knight and then we've still got bishop b4s. So, uh, I don't know if knight d5, maybe there's no rescue here for the black position. But it was just made to look like he, he just smashed a uh, Patsa, didn't he, in this game. Max Erber was just out of out of sorts here. Um, but to be fair, you know, he, he had a big family, he was a family man, he, and chess was just a hobby, really, for him. He was a hobby world champion, and, and uh, Alexander Alkind, you know, was the kind of 
obsessive kind of one of the most obsessive uh, chess players active um, in chess and okay this this was uh, this was a huge punishment for you know he, he's letting his bishop being trapped because he's opening up these other dynamic possibilities in the center against the king against the rook it doesn't matter for the bishop to be trapped it's a disaster he's, he's just playing um, with one full position here if if let's just check uh, well, it's not even worth checking it there's nothing to check you know if rook if rook takes a6 we just just make black we use that pin that, that's pinned we just mate so disaster so how not to play with black okay uh, so in interesting games and uh, startling how um, the games are often decided from openings uh, massive advantages incurred from the openings I uh, hope you enjoyed tonight's uh, session and we'll carry on this match next week okay comments or questions on YouTube when I upload it thanks very much so see you next week.